just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. The start of 2014 means uh, that the borders are now open in their entirety uh, to uh, re residents of Romania and uh, Bulgaria to the rest of the European Union. Uh, it's created quite a stir across the channel in the UK. We're going to talk about how it's affected things in Germany in a moment. First, though, uh, let's say hello once again uh, to our guest, Yves Pascuo, who heads the European Migration and Diversity Program at the Brussels-based European Policy Center. Laurent Pinsol, spokesperson for the neo-Gaullist Debout La République Party, and Samir Millet, uh, who's the chair of La Voix des Roms, the voice of uh, the, do you say the Rome or the Romani? The Romes. The Romes, <laughs> the Romes in English, okay. Romani people. Um, we uh, were talking uh, just before the break about some of, showing some of those reactions in the name of the free market. We give you one, which is The Economist, reminding its readers that the Tories in power now argued for Sofia and Bucharest to join the EU, pending an editorial that rolls out the welcome mat to Bulgarians and Romanians. The going will be rough at first, but the history of many waves of immigration tell us that before too long, you will be folded comfortably into British society. Closing the borders, Laurent Pinsol, uh, does that make France less vibrant? Uh, it's not closing 100%. We are not saying that we should not let anybody coming in, into France. What we are saying is that given the circumstances, every year the parliament should vote a quota for immigrants to come in France so that we could adapt. Uh, let's not forget that during the 60s, uh, General de Gaulle let many migrants come into France because we were needing them. And right now, I think the circumstances are completely different. And it's not to say that there's going to be no migrants, but we are willing to half the number of migrants coming into France. Right now, 200,000 people are coming into France every year. And we say that probably 100,000 would be more reasonable so that the net influx would be close to zero. Well, if I may react on this, uh, it's clearly what Nicolas Sarkozy tried to do with his immigration choisi and immigration subi. Chosen immigration. And suffered immigration. Uh, it was clear that the suffered immigration is the family reunification, but here again, uh, family reunification is a fundamental right. So if you want to uh, decrease this fundamental right, this is a political decision that has to be taken, but it has to be taken within the framework of the European Convention of Human Rights, Article 8, which, uh, which is related to the right to family life and private life. And secondly, with a European Union directive on the right to family reunification, which you will have to renegotiate if you want to so you're diminish. So you're saying that European law, in this case, supersedes yeah. national law. And yeah. that's one of the things that ruffles feathers and angers the likes of Laurent Pinsol. Yeah. So that's why we propose to denounce all these treaties. It was in Nicolas Dupont-Aignan program in 2012. We said that we do not accept those treaties. They are not, uh, I would say, legitimate since 2005 because 55% of French people say no to the uh, European Constitution. And three years later, Nicolas Sarkozy made it vote by the Parliament. And Which it is was not a democratic arena. That's right. It's a democratic arena, but to undo what the people of France, what the French citizens have done three years later, and after having promised to do a, a little treaty, because what he promised during his campaign was to do a small treaty related to only institutional um, questions and also taking into account the no of the French people. He did not do that. So it was not his mandate to vote exactly the same treaty the French had said no to in 2005. Okay, so you're, you're, you're unpopular uh, among those who want more sovereignty for national states. But let me just ask you, Yves Pascual, will the opening of the borders mean that a lot of Romanians and Bulgarians will be showing up in London and Paris? Uh, did it happen? Uh, we have to recall also that only nine remaining member states, which means that the other 16, the other 16 ones, had already opened their labour market to Romanians and Bulgarians, and we have not seen a wave of Romanians and Bulgarians going to the other member states. So the nine remaining member states, which have 
not open their border because Romania and Bulgaria are not into the Schengen area so far, but they have opened, they have not opened, they were obliged, obliged under the treaty to grant access to the labor market. So we will not see a wave of Romanians and Bulgarians coming into France, Germany or the UK for one also simple reason is that is there a job for them? If there is a job for them, they will get access to the labor market. If there is no job access, if there is no job available, so they will go elsewhere or remain in Romania. Even the economist in the article you mentioned said that in the 90s, the labor government said, oh, okay, there's going to be like tens of thousands of Poles coming into Great Britain. In the end, half a million came in. But the article also says that that had a great positive impact on the UK economy. Yeah, yeah but mm -hmm. uh, the economist is sometimes a little bit biased, I would say, on the on the liberty question. They are just willing to let everybody do whatever they want, and especially coming in around the world, both from a personal and an economic perspective. So I don't think their opinion here might be... Uh, Unquestioned, I would say. And on top of that, one should remember that the difference in minimum wage between the countries, the minimum wage in Romania or Bulgaria is a tenth of the minimum wage in France. And therefore, somebody who has a qualification uh, for a certain job can just switch borders and earn 10 times more. And that's huge. And that's a powerful lever. I do admit that given the economic circumstances, maybe fewer people are going to come. But nevertheless, the, the, the huge difference in wages is a, is and, a, and a threat. And a huge difference in cost of living as well. That's true too. Now, the shadow immigration minister, Labour's David Hansen, says the problem's <clears throat> not at the border. The problem is inside, at the workplace. My criticism of the government is that they haven't yet done all the things that we would want them to do, which we've been calling for them to do since March of this year. For example, we need to have stronger enforcement of the minimum wage. We need to ensure that we have action taken on gangmasters who are bringing people over. Action taken on gangmasters that are bringing people over. Uh, Samir Mille, there's this idea that... Uh, uh, with the open borders, and this is the opposition speaking in this case, with the open borders, uh, it means that there's a, a lot of um, unsavory types that are entering inside the UK. Well, the borders, uh, this will not change so much. As I said before, the, the borders with these two countries were open times ago. In 2007, when the Romanian, the Rom Romania and Bulgaria entered into the European Union, we had already the freedom of movement, which th there, there was a, a control at the border, which w was uh, more of a formality than something else. Uh, so it, it is not about masses of people arriving here or there. Those who wanted, who needed to leave their countries, they did so years ago. But he's arguing that there are people coming over to work low-paid jobs, with ringleaders. Now, the, we, we are speaking and about studies, about figures, about the economists, about media, about positions of this or that political party. We have a crisis, that's for sure. This economic crisis is what people see or what people watch on the TV or listen to the radio. But there is another crisis which is much deeper. And this crisis is not the cultural uh, danger of uh, brought with the, 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 the mig migrants. It, it is a political crisis. It is a political thinking crisis. And uh, when you say this was the opposition talking, yeah, of course, I, for, for a few years I, I, I cannot uh, really distinguish what's the, what's the, 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 the deep difference between the left and the right-wing parties, including sometimes even extremist ideas who enter in the mainstream uh, policies, mainstream parties, who, which are governing countries. Uh, now, there is another reality, which is the reality. I don't know, but when I listen to the president of the, the Confédération Paysanne in France saying that every year there is, there are 100,000 jobs in the agriculture in France which have no candidates, no one wants them. 
And on the other side, we see people coming from Romania and Bulgaria who are peasants and who cannot access these jobs. This is just a problem for them because they, can, they couldn't get these jobs before. And it is also a problem for the French economy because th this, is, this is economy. Life is there. Life is not... And, and are you saying these farm workers will be welcomed in the Sorry? end? Do you think those farm workers will be welcomed in the end? Of course. Of course. There is no reason. I mean, if, if we think pragmatically, you have a lot of economic sectors. I was speaking about agriculture, but on the other hand, you have uh, all the, the construction sector, for instance. Uh, there is always, there is systematically need for workers there. And there are also people who would like to work in these sectors, but who are prevented to, to work there because they have no papers, because have, they have not the rights to work. And uh, this is just pragmatism. It is not about uh, being uh, liberal or conservative or whatever. It is about the life. The life is there. Uh, enterprises are there. Workers are there. And the link is... Uh, broken because of the speeches and because of the political class, which uh, uh, prefers to to play with the notions, with concepts uh, which are um, disconnected from the, these realities. If Pascal, yeah, just adding to uh, to this, uh, which I fully agree with, uh, saying that. This is the rationale of the single European labour market, allocating the, wor the workforce where it is needed. There are some sectors of activities under a high strain. Uh, in France, there are people able to fill in those jobs coming from Spain, Italy, Romania or Bulgaria, so they will fill the, those jobs in. What I mean is that the single European labour market is also functioning in a proper way. Look at what is happening in Spain, for instance. There's, <coughs> there is a huge uh, problem of youth unemployment. And a lot of young people move to Germany, for instance, to get their job. So is it a good thing to have young Spanish people staying in Spain and losing their time in Spain and capacities and skills? Or is it a good thing to allow them to move to Germany and to get a position there which is good for them, which is good for Germany and which is also good for Spain? This is the rationale of the single European labour market. This is the basis of the EU construction. We have built this process, this political process for over 60 years, which is based on freedom. Limiting freedom of movement of people is clearly undermining the EU project. Laurent Pinsol, it's still difficult to find a plumber these days in France, even though the polls have been <laughs> in for a while. <laughs> so first, let me just uh, respond to, to those points. First, the invisible end for the EU labour market, I don't believe in it. The invisible end was responsible for the crisis of 2008. It was not immigration, I do agree. So just uh, believing in the invisible hand for me is... Uh, what, what do you mean by invisible hand? Just free letting markets the free markets for the wool of European Union, I don't think mm. it's going to work. Second, I don't think it is a solution even for young Spaniards or young Greeks because it means just uh, moving like 2,000 kilometers away from their families, from their friends. Uh, they, it's harsh just forcing people to leave their countries unwillingly, like what is done right now in Greece or Spain, because there is a 50% unemployment rate for young people. I think it's brutal. I think it's a new man. And I don't think it is a model to, to, for, for the European Union. And overall, the, the, the unemployment rate in the European Union is increasing. So I don't think the policies uh, that have been... Uh, developed by the European Union here work. Nevertheless, I do agree that on very specific uh, uh, cases, if there is a huge lack of skills within a country, we could open our borders on a limited time, on a limited period for a limited number of people. And we do know ha uh, that right now in France we lack doctors, for example, because the uh, curriculum was too low in the 80s. Maybe, okay, we could do something for a short-term period. But in the medium term, what we should do is to uh, uh, push young people in the right direction and uh, not uh, disqualify manual jobs, as we have done in France for the last 30 years at least, 
and uh, ensure that we have the, the right people because it's just crazy to have 25% unemployment for young people in France and still, as you were saying, have some vacancies for some jobs in uh, agriculture or construction. And therefore, we should also work on a more long-term perspective to ensure that everybody can find a job in All France. Right. In the short term, however, as we said at the top, a leaked document ahead of the Bavarian Conservative CSU Party's Congress putting into practice a new slogan that can loosely be translated as you cheat, you're gone. I can only advise against poisoning our domestic political climate. We know that immigrants from Romania and Bulgaria have a higher labor force participation rate than our... All right, that was uh, the opposition Greens uh, speaking there. Um, a uh, spokeswoman, uh, rather spokeswoman, the chairwoman of the CSU's parliamentary group, Gerda Hasselfeld, saying, we're committed to the right of freedom of movement in the European Union, but do not want this freedom to be abused and we do not want people to immigrate into our national social insurance system. That's what this is about. We want to prevent abuse, so she says. Um, let, let me ask you um, uh, at this point, of course, there is an underlining subtext to all this, which is the Roma. And the, the CSU is saying in a veiled way that basically you're going to have a lot more Roma people, and, and Roma people are resented in a lot of circles these days in places like Munich and uh, Paris and, and, um, and London? Uh, there are no Roma in European Union. There are no such thing as Roma in the European Union because the European Union is a club of states. It started with five of them, now 28. And all the citizens of these countries are European citizens. This is what has been decided by the treaties. And the Roms who live in states of the European Union are not a problem in many, uh, on many issues, actually, on many subjects. We provide rather the solutions, but we are not listened to. In 2000, I worked in, in a network, in an informal network of Romani activists at the European level, proposing a framework, uh, a frame statute for Romani people in European Union, which started by the idea that we are citizens of our countries, of our respective countries. And as such, we are also citizens of the European Union. And there is n absolutely no particular uh, risk of uh, uh, rooms benefiting from social welfare services or whatever. There is there's absolutely no such particular risk. Now, when and what is positive uh, since two days is that before actually, uh, Romanian and Bulgarian citizens, and here I am speaking about all of them, not only those of Romani ethnic background, they didn't have the right to work, and in the same time, they didn't have access to social services, neither. There were but the Aide Médicale d'État, which is a, a basic health insurance in, in France. Now, uh, as they will get the right to work, in the same time, I mean, they will work like anyone else, and they will also pay the taxes and the charges for the social uh, insurance and, and health insurance and so on. So, really, it is just about equality. Uh, the Roma who make up, I think, what is it, three and a half percent of Romania's population, a very small minority, maybe a bit more. Oh, yeah, a, a bit more, a bit more, uh, about 10 percent. But how, how much how much would you say, Yves Pascual, has the question of the Roma clouded this issue over Romanians and Bulgarians? I think it, it has clouded it, but I think that we should also be clear on one thing, is that putting the blame on some specific people, Romanian, Romanians, Bulgarians and Roma people, is a really, really dangerous game, because we will wake up tomorrow with a very big headache saying, well, what did we do? Why did we play this game with, and you're fully right, these are EU citizens. We have negotiated with them for years in order to say you will be into the European Union and the day you will be in, you'll be EU citizens, which means that from the 1st January 2007, 
Romanians, the Bulgarians, and the Roma people within this my, uh, within uh, this country are EU citizens and are entitled to move within the European Union, i.e. to go and stay in, in another member state stage for a period up to three months. So we have to be clear on those things and we have also to, uh, to, to be clear on another one which is that the, the question of abusing rights is a question which is dealt with within the existing rules. Just implement what we have and we will be able also to address that issue. All right, implement the rights. Um, a spokesperson for the SPD, the Social Democrats, which are in this grand coalition with the CSU and the city of Angela Merkel, saying whoever sings this sort of melody invites right-wing extremism to the dance. Do you agree with that? Which melody? Ah, the, the, the melody of, uh, of this is about trying to prevent cheaters and trying to prevent abuse. No, I would not say that. I would not say that because uh, preventing cheaters, I think, is a basic work for the government. And saying that there should not be uh, cheaters is uh, basic uh, politics, I think. And I, sh I think we should pay attention also not to qualify, to overqualify people from extreme right or far right, uh, because otherwise uh, it's kind of blurring the lines between uh, some position that may be different from yours, but that are not xenophobe or racist. And I think that here the SPD is, uh, is making a fault. You think the SPD is wrong? CSU, by the way, insists it's still pro-European. That would exclude it. We were talking about The Economist. It would exclude it from tomorrow's cover, uh, which has uh, uh, the leaders of the Dutch far right, uh, Gerrit Wilders, in the same boat, literally, or the same teapot, if you will, as uh, Eurosceptic UKIP leader Nigel Farage, and who's that woman there in the front there pointing her finger, uh, Laurent Pinsol? It's Marine Le Pen, but I don't think they are the same. Okay, Gerd Wilders and Marine Le Pen are rather close, but I don't think that Marine Le Pen and Nigel Farage uh, do relate, really. Uh, and uh, as a fact, uh, Nigel Farage has supported Nicolas Dupont-Aignan and not Marine Le Pen for the next uh, European elections uh, that are this year. Of course, they do have something in common, which is uh, they're all doing very well in the polls ahead of those May elections, Yves Pascual. Yeah, but we have also to nuance a little bit what will come out of the, the, the June 2014 elections. It is true that uh, far right or extremists or populist party, parties, whatever, you, you call them, will score very good in some member states, but not in all the, the member states. Uh, taking this into account, it is clear that Marine Le Pen will perhaps uh, win the European Parliament's elections in France, but that doesn't mean that the European Parliament will then be composed with uh, anti-EU, anti-migrants, an anti-establishment uh, MEPs, because there is, and you've uh, rightly said it, there, is all, there are also distinctions and divisions between those representatives. They are not all uh, agreeing on the same things. Some are clearly anti-migrants, other ones are anti-EU and not anti-migrants. So it means that this part of the MEPs will have also to talk together, which is absolutely not one for the time being. So their, Im their impact on the European Parliament and on Euro European policies might, might be less important than we can expect and than what we Hang say. On, you're saying there won't be a seismic impact on the center right and the center left if the national front, if the far right comes out top of the May European elections? In France or at EU level? In France and at the EU level. I think that in France it is going to be a huge, uh, it, it is going to have a huge impact. But this is going to be a domestic uh, impact. Just, and at, your, uh, at European level, just have a look to uh, Yves Bertoncini from uh, Notre Europe Institut Jacques Delors, has written a very interesting paper, which is, uh, which is downloaded uh, online, which clearly says, just have a look on the map and just have a look to who will be elected from which country and what will be the effect on the composition of the European Parliament. And it comes to the conclusion that the impact of the anti-EU, anti-migrants, anti-establishment uh, group will not be as 
huge and as important as we can expect today, because we are seeing this through French, uh, through French lenses, which is to say, well, Marine Le Pen is going to score around 20-25%, which is a huge score, but this is not the case in the other member states. We are 28 but member states. Establishment parties will fare better. Some still believe in an integrated Europe, though. Good citizens of Riga bidding adieu to the lot on New Year's Eve and toasting the arrival of the euro as uh, their currency. That makes it 18 countries embracing uh, the common currency. Laurent Pinsol. I don't think the majority of the population was in favor of joining the euro. If you looked at the polls uh, conducted uh, last year, a majority of the population was not for it. So, OK, they are making that bet, but uh, what we could look is that the Eurozone has 3 million more people unemployed uh, now versus 2010, right, whereas so the rest of... It's a, it, it's a bad bet. We're going to have yeah, to leave it's a bad it bet. There. Laurent Pinsel, we will nonetheless wish a Happy New Year to everybody in Riga and elsewhere. I want to say thank you to Yves Pasquot and Samir Millet for being with us. Thank you for joining us here for the France 24 debate.